All right, so if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, let's open up to John chapter 15. I'm going to be reading from verses 9 through 17. And uh, if you could stand for the reading of the word. Hear God's word. As a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no, no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for these words. Father, as we pay attention and draw our attention to your word today, Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to us, that you transform us from the inside out. We worship you, almighty God, in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So there was a movie called Toy Story that came out a long, long time ago. And uh, it's about friendship. And there's a song that's got, called You've Got a Friend in Me. And it's, it's a great song. And it talks about friendship and the importance of friendship. And so let me ask you, how many friends do you truly have? What is a friend? That's an interesting question to ask because a lot of times we are confused when it comes to friendship. Facebook really didn't help because they have anybody you know or you have a connection with, they use the term friends. And um, do you know that there's a limit in how many friends you could have on Facebook? Does anybody know what the limit is? 5,000. Do you have more than 5,000 friends, Fred? Sorry? Your friend does? Yeah, so apparently, after 5,000 friends, you can't have any more friends. So if you want to add more friends, you have to drop friends, right? And I think there's an exception. If you're a celebrity, then they let you have more than 5,000 friends. So that's one way to have more friends, just become famous. So, so I'm not there yet. You know? So I went on Facebook the other day, and apparently I have over a thousand friends, which is crazy because I don't know them. <laughs> I really don't, right? And so, you know, the, the, the question remains is, so does, does friendship really matter, right? And of course it does, and here's why. Because we are created in the image of God. And since we are created in the image of God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit lives in perfect harmony, community, and friendship. So if we are created in the image of God, that means we, are, we need friends in our lives. That's why when Adam was made, when God created Adam, everything was good except it was not good that he was alone. Now granted, Adam was already had a relationship. He already had a relationship with God. This is before the fall. So he had a relationship with God, but yet, because he was created in the image of God, Adam, God said it was not good for him to be alone, which is why God created Eve. And so now, before the fall, that was friendship, perfect friendship. In our days, we actually have a lot of acquaintances, right? We know people, or we think we know people, and 
instead of using the term an acquaintance, we call them a friend. And there are many differences between friends and acquaintances. I'm just going to list a few here because I think it's important for us to kind of understand, at least from a worldly view, the difference between a friend and an acquaintance. So the left side, the white side would be an acquaintance. So, so they don't share much with you or show vulnerability, right, when, when it comes to an acquaintance. You never want to see, you don't never want to reveal your dark secrets with them. They act differently with their other friends. So I don't know if you've seen that, um, but they're just acquaintances, especially as a pastor. You know, people behave differently when they know you're a pastor. So even strangers, when you say you're a pastor, all of a sudden they feel like they have to act differently. So I'm kind of cursed that way. I remember when I first moved into my development, I met my neighbor. And we're having a good time, we're talking, and he's, you know, he's cursing up a storm, and of course I don't say anything. And then he goes, oh, what do you do? And I said, I'm a pastor. And then he just said, oh, first he said, holy crap. <laughs> and then he said, and then he apologized, right? Um, and then ever since then, he was very different when he talked to me, which I feel like it's, it's not good. Um, they don't remember much of what you tell them. I don't know if you've experienced that. You know, you pour your heart out to somebody, uh, you know, and then they turn around and say, so, so what are you doing tomorrow? You know, um, they're uninterested in meeting or befriending your other friends, and they don't go out of their way to lend a hand. Okay, so that's a mark of an acquaintance versus a friend, and uh, you don't turn to them when you need support. So those are kind of acquaintances. They may think you're a friend, but if anyone falls in these categories, they're really not friends. So here's, here's uh, what true friendship may look like. You know, they make you feel good. They accept you for who you are. So you don't have to pretend to be someone else. They are honest and trustworthy. Uh, they share personal and intimate things with you, which is the opposite of what I just talked about. They apologize when they've hurt you. They care about your feelings. And they want to do stuff you both like. Okay. So if you really narrow this down, in terms of relationship, acquaintances are typically transactional, whereas true friendship is relational. And as I said earlier, since God created us in his own image, we need that relational side of things, not transactional. I do something for you, you do something for me. That doesn't work. Actually, uh, Sarah Christensen said this, you know, acquaintances may keep score within the relationship, but true friendships have no strings attached. And I don't know if you know people who keep score. I actually have a family member who does that, and she's pretty annoying. Right? So she has this bank that she keeps. You know? Oh, I've done all these things for Jay, so therefore, Jay could do these things for me. And it's, it's annoying. You know? And it's sad that you know, we're family. And so even in a family relationship, it, it, it doesn't work. Right? Now here's something that's interesting, right? Uh, if you read the Bible, or if you even paid attention to what I read just now, it says that believers are friends of God. We were friend of God. You know, there's actually a lot of songs that talk about that. You know, we, we sang a, a hymn today. There's also a contemporary song, you know, I'm a friend of God, he calls me friend. You know, there's a song like that. And so we, we, we sing about it, but I don't know if we've actually thought the significance of being a friend of God. Aristotle said that man can never be friends with a God. And why did Aristotle say that? Because he believes that you need to be like equals to be friends, like social equals, right? 
That's why it's hard for someone who's wealthy to be friends with someone who's poor, because socially you're not equal. It, it's, it's hard for even races to, to really, different races to be good friends. I mean, I'm see, we're seeing more of that here in America, but unless you're socially equal, like even if you're good friends with a, someone from a different race, you have something in common, like similar income level or similar jobs, or you live in a similar zip code, right? So that's what Aristotle says. So even in human relationships, we have a hard time when we're not the same. So imagine how can God be friends with someone that he's created? And that's why when you speak to people outside of Christianity, right? This is where they get tripped up. They said, there's no way. God is God. And we're nobody. So there's no way we could be friends with God. And yet, Scripture talks about this. And yet, that's what's different between what, who we believe in, our God, and other gods. Abraham was called a friend of God, right? And just, this is just one example. But also, Moses was also called a friend of God. So even in the Old Testament, there are references, you know, Abraham and Moses being friends of God. So today's text actually talks about this and the significance of this and why it matters, okay? So... In case you got lost in the words and the sentences of Pastor Mike's preaching, right? We are in the middle of the upper room discourse. Now, my church, because I ask them every Sunday about the upper room discourse, they know what it is. So, do you guys know what the upper room discourse is? Last supper. The, last the, the Last Supper. So, what happens right after the upper room discourse? Betrayal, right? So Jesus is, this is the last time he's actually having a conversation with his disciples before he dies on the cross. This is it, right? And when you know this is the last time you're going to have a conversation with somebody, you only talk about stuff that matters, right? Even like people I know when they're sick, when they think they're going to die, you know, and I get to minister to people like that a lot. They, they don't want to talk about the nonsense. They just get straight to the point, you know. And sometimes it's, it's too direct. But they don't want to waste any time, right? They don't need to talk about the weather, right? You need to talk about things that matter, right? And so Jesus, he knows this is it, right? And so what is the main message that he wants to talk about? Well, the main message that he's talking to his disciples is about love. That's the main message, right? And so what does he say? Love, 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 and in verse 9 that we read today, it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now, even if you don't know much about the Bible, many people know that our God is a God of love. As a matter of fact, when they want to have an argument with us, they'll say, well, your, your God is a God of love, but I'm not feeling any love. That's why I can't believe in your God. But... Our God is love. And Jesus reminds his disciples that God is a God of love. So he starts by saying, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So if you have any kind of relationship with me, you're going to understand who God is and that God is love. Everything that God does is based out of that fact, that God is love. 
And so he tells his disciples to abide, to remain in my love. How do you abide? How do you remain in God's love? Well, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So you have to keep God's commandments. That's how you remain in God's love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments. So what Jesus is asking us to do is not something that he hasn't done already. So just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now he's saying this because, yes, he is the only one who kept all of God's commandments. No one else has. So because he has kept the Father's commandments, we are able to keep through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the good news. And that's why we need Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yeah. But what's the big deal? What's the point of abiding in God's love? Well, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. That your joy may be complete, as the NIV would say it. So if you want to experience complete joy, you need the joy of God in you. And when we live out God's commandments, and when we remain in his love, then we experience complete joy. I know many brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who have joined their hearts even when their whole world is falling apart. Sometimes, and I'm saying this, you know, with complete transparency and honesty, sometimes my wife and I would say, I don't know how this person has so much joy. It's almost like they're on drugs, but they're not. I mean, we know somebody who you know, a family member dies, and then just one thing after another, like their house gets hit by lightning, you know, and they lose all these things all in a matter of week, and they're still able to praise Jesus. How? From a worldly standpoint, it makes no sense. I also know someone else was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And if anyone had the right to be upset at God, it's this person. She was in full-time ministry, impacting people left and right, doing all kinds of stuff for God. And then she gets diagnosed with cancer. And her attitude was, I don't have much time left to spread the gospel. Until the day she died, that's what she did. How? Was she able to do this? She had the joy of the Lord in her. There is no such thing as bad news if you have the good news of Jesus Christ in your heart. So some of you may be having a horrible week, a horrible month, a horrible year, but may God give you joy and the strength and the courage to continue on. Only God, only his joy can give you strength. And so that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. What's interesting is he's the one who should be encouraged right now because he's about to die. He's facing death. And in the midst of facing death, he is still encouraging his disciples. How is Jesus able to do it? Because he has joy in his heart. That's why how he was able to even die on the cross for the joy set before him. Scripture reminds us. 
So here he says to keep my commandments. What are the commandments that he's talking about? Because he said a lot of things, right? Well, in case you were wondering, he narrows it down to just one commandment. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus was asked, and his answer was to love God with everything, with your whole being, with everything that you have, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That was the greatest commandment. If you unpack the Ten Commandments, really, the first four is love God with everything that you have. And then the six commandments after that is to love your neighbor as yourself. So everything is about loving God and loving one another. Now here, Jesus reduces that to just love one another. Well, the assumption is that the love of God is already there. If you look at the church, most people know that they have to love God. Right? They come to church, they want to love God. You know, when they sing praises, they lift up their hands, they want to love God. So, so most people don't have to be reminded too much about loving God, but we have a problem with our neighbors. Right? That's who we have problems with. And so when Jesus says, this is my commandment, he's not saying, don't love God. Okay, so please understand that. Loving God is already a given. Love one another, how? As I have loved you is what Jesus is commanding. Love one another as I have loved you. And it doesn't matter what church I'm in, there are always friends and enemies in the church. D.A. Carson said that the church is a collection of not friends, but it's a collection of natural enemies. Because if you unpack even what Aristotle said, you have to have something in common, right, to be good friends. Most churches I know is not that. There's always someone or a group that's different. And naturally, you don't hang out with people who are different than you. you know. When we had a permanent location in Fort Lee, after church, we would have a time of fellowship, just like you guys. And actually, the round tables that you have, some of them are from our old church. So we had the same round tables. And so people would sit down, and you could just tell who's going to sit with whom. It's always the same, every Sunday. So we had all the singles. They all sat together. We had all the moms, they all sat together. We had all the basketball players, they all sat together. And then the misfits just kind of sat by themselves. That was church, right? It's a collection of enemies. So how do you love one another? Because when I look at that, I'm not seeing this kind of love that Jesus is talking about. What kind of love is Jesus talking about? How has Jesus loved his disciples? How has Jesus loved us? Well, Jesus loved us by coming down here on earth. He gave everything up. He sacrificed everything, right? He came here on earth. He lived the perfect life that you and I should have lived, but we can't. And then he died the death that we deserve so that through his death, we may have eternal life. 
That's how Jesus showed his love for us. So to love one another as I have loved you is, I'm telling you, impossible to do without Jesus Christ. You can't do it. But that's what God and that's what Jesus is commanding his disciples to do. And then he continues, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Not only did Jesus give up everything in heaven, he gave up his life. And he says, there's no greater love than this, that you would do this for your friends. Right? So there's an out. You don't have to do this for your enemies. Okay? But you do this for your friends. So one of the characteristics of true friendship is that you sacrificially give everything. Right? You don't take, but you give. I want to challenge you to reflect on your friendships right now. Is your friendship based on giving or receiving? What can I get from this relationship or is it what can I give? But a mark of a true friend, one of the marks, is that you give everything just as Jesus has. The second mark of a friendship is you tell secrets. You have an intimate relationship and you're vulnerable and you share everything. So those are the two things that you need in friends. Jesus calls us his friends. Jesus calls his, di his disciples his friends. Look at verse 14. It says, you are my friends. That's a shocking statement. The Son of God calling people, right? You are my friends. But it looks like there's a condition attached here. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. So if you do everything that Jesus commands, you automatically become his friends. Wrong. That's not what this sentence means. You do what Jesus commands you because you are his friend. It's a characteristic of friendship. So let's understand that. So don't leave this place thinking, I got to do everything that's written in the Bible in order to become his friends. No, that's not true. We do it because we are his friends. Not only he calls us his friends, Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants. No longer. So does that mean we were servants before that? The real translation of that word is slave, by the way. I no longer call you slaves. Why is that? Why is Jesus saying, I no longer call you slaves? Because we are his slaves because he's the master. Do you call your Jesus Lord? When you call Jesus Lord, that means you're a slave. Right? If Jesus is your Lord, and that's like the question we like to ask people right, when we're evangelizing, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Right? That means you do everything the Lord tells you to do. But 
especially in America, that when we see that word slave, it just, it's so, there's so much baggage with that word slave. The translators change it to servant, or if you have your ESV Bible, there's a footnote, it may say bond servant, but the real word is slave. But it's not the slave that we think. But when you're a slave, that means everything, you, you're, you give everything to your master. You do whatever the master asks you to do. And the master does not have to explain to the servants or the slaves anything he wants you to do. So if the master says, I want you to do this, we don't have to, he doesn't have to tell us why. You don't ask why, you just do. That's a job of a slave. That's a job of a servant. But you see the type of relationship Jesus wants to have with us. I'm no longer calling you slaves, but I have called you friends. That doesn't mean he's not our Lord. Sometimes we take this friendship thing too far and goes, well, Jesus is my buddy. He's not. We are a friend of Jesus. And that carries so much power, by the way. Being a friend of somebody. Back in the time of Jesus, if you were a friend of Caesar, that gave you a lot of privileges. In the same way, being a friend of God gives you a lot of privilege. We had just forgotten about that. We just think we just go out and hang out with Jesus and have a good time. That's not the kind of friendship Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about a relationship where you give everything, you sacrifice everything, and a relationship where you are vulnerable and you share everything. Jesus continues. You're my friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. There are no secrets. Jesus had made known to his friends. So Jesus is modeling, Jesus is demonstrating what true friendship looks like. He gave everything, and he has no secrets. That's the kind of relationship that God has with us. And that's why we are friends of Jesus Christ. Earlier I said that being friends of Jesus, the characteristics of that would be that we would obey his commands. We would do everything he commands us to do. And I said, and the opposite doesn't work. If you do everything that he commands us to do, it doesn't make us automatically friends. So how does one become friends with God? How do you become friends with Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Okay. You did not choose me, but I chose you. There it is in black and white. It's very clear, right? There are some people who have, who has an allergic reaction to the terms predestination or election. So I won't use those words. I'll just say this, according to Jesus, you did not choose him, he chose you. And appointed you and set you apart that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. What fruit is Jesus talking about here? Fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Spirit is, do you guys know that? Everybody knows it, right? Starts with love, 
It's always, whenever I ask the church to say it, it always starts strong. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, and self-control. Right? The fruit of the Spirit. Well, you could say, well, I learned it in the King James, the NIV. They're all a little different. But the fruit of the Spirit is what we are called to bear. And how do you bear fruit? You have to be attached. You have to be attached to the vine. Because we're just branches. Right? How do you attach to the vine? You abide in his love. Okay? So when you abide in his love, which means you obey his commandments, which means you are a friend of Jesus, which means he chose you, you didn't choose him. If that's the life you're living, then you're going to bear fruit. It's just, it's automatic. You're going to bear fruit. You can't on your own bear fruit. You could try. You could fool people. But eventually, people will see that your fruit is not from God. Like an apple tree cannot bear pears. And sometimes we get away with pretending. I know people who have pretended for over two decades. But eventually, it comes out. If you're not connected to the vine. So don't try. Just be. And that's the context of this verse where he says, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This is not, in the name of Jesus, I demand a million dollars. People take verses like, like this out of context all the time. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Really? You know? You know where you see that a lot? You see that, that verse a lot in gyms, right? I can do all things as you're pumping iron. That's not the context of that verse. Paul was in prison when he said this. And he was talking about being content in whatever is thrown at him. So here, whatever you ask the Father in my name is in, the, is in the context of bearing fruit, is in the context of being connected to the vine, remaining in him. Because the world we live in is trying to pull us away, is trying to teach us a false gospel. Whatever you ask in the Father's, Father in his name, he will give it to you. May our prayers be that we remain in him and that we would bear much fruit in the name of Jesus Christ. Because he has chosen us, even if we're not the best of friends, he will not abandon us. Have you had friends, friends, who would always say, I'm there for you, but when, when the rubber meets the road, they're not there. Right? So according to the definition that I gave you, those are all acquaintances, right? They're not there for you. Right? A good friend would be there no matter what. A good friend would be there even if you're going to die. A good friend, according to what we looked at, would actually give up their life for you. So let's see what kind of friends we are to Jesus Christ. Let's see what kind of friends the disciples were to Jesus. In Matthew 26, this is right before Jesus is about to die. He tells his friends, listen, I need you to be with me. I need you to pray for me. Because I'm about to face the most difficult day of my life. Would you do that for me? Of course, our answer is yes. We will do it for you. 
So all Jesus asked was to sit here while I go over there and pray. Can you do that for me? So what does Jesus find? Disciples were sleeping. And so Jesus tells Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Just watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So, you know, our God is a God of second chances. You probably heard that many times. So then he goes away again. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. And his prayer is, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. You know, he's, he's about to face the cross. He's pouring out his heart to God the Father. And he just needed some friends to be there with him. And again, he found them sleeping. Good friend or bad friends? The only good friend we have is Jesus Christ. And none of us, none of us are good friends to him. But through him, through Jesus Christ, we're able to be good friends. So for us to be good friends with one another, it starts with our friendship with God. So let me ask you, is Jesus your friend or foe? And just as a reminder, James says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So you cannot be friends with the world and with God at the same time. It's one or the other. For years and decades and centuries, people were trying to figure out how do we become friends with God and the world? We want to live in the best of both worlds. There was a time when churches were trying to be relevant. And what were they doing? They were trying to send out a message saying, you could be friends with the world and with God. And they started watering down what we do in church. There's nothing wrong with getting rid of, well, there is a lot of stuff that we were doing that's wrong, but they were trying to say there's nothing wrong with, let's remove the cross. Let's talk about the gospel, but in a roundabout way. And so they started to water down the truth. To the point where there are some worship services that look like a raw concert and not like a worship service. And when people leave the church, they feel like they had a great connection with God when the music was awesome. You cannot be friends with the world and with God at the same time. So let's be friends with God. Amen? So let me ask you this. Is Jesus Christ a friend or an acquaintance? There's one thing to know about Jesus. And believe me, there are people with multiple degrees teaching at seminaries who know all you need to know about Jesus. 
but their relationship with Jesus is an acquaintance level. They just know about him. They don't know Jesus. You don't need seminary degrees to know Jesus Christ. And if you know Jesus Christ, then the way you live becomes transformed. If Jesus is your friend, not just as God, because if Jesus is God, which he is, and you're just a little created being, then whenever we repent, it will be repenting to this great God. Like, God, you're amazing, you're awesome, you created the world, you created me, I'm a sinner, please forgive me. So even that, that repentance, it's a little transactional. But what does repentance look like in a relational relationship? When was the last time you had to ask for forgiveness from somebody you really know? If you're asking for forgiveness for somebody you don't know, yeah, you may feel bad. But once it's done, you're good, right? But if you had to ask forgiveness for somebody you really care about, It's not just the guilt, but, but there's, there's, there's grief there. And so when we repent, it should be like we're repenting and we're asking for forgiveness from somebody who's really close to you. It's not just the transactional I'm a sinner, please forgive me. But you really feel the anguish and you see how you hurt the person. So even your repentance becomes richer. So when Jesus says we are his friend, that's what he's talking about. And that's what I want all of us here to know and understand. I want all of us to have this type of relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he is Lord. Yes, we are servants. But yes, we are friends. David talks about the difference between friends, and someone who you don't care about, right? Psalm 55. If it's the enemy who taunts me, I get it. I can bear that. But if, if it's a friend, a companion, my equal, boy, does that hurt. And so, brothers and sisters, when we go to God in repentance, and we've already done it today, right? There was a time of repentance in our worship service. Let's make sure it's not a transactional check thing that we do. But know how much it hurts Jesus Christ and the pain that he faced when he died on the cross for us so that we could receive complete forgiveness. And then Jesus reminds his disciples, these things I command you so that you love one another. We need to love one another, folks. We love one another because he loved us first. 
We become friends with one another because and only because he became friends with us. Aristotle said, if you're not equal, you cannot be friends. Jesus says, if you're not equal, you are friends. So let's make sure that Jesus is your friend, which means that we obey his commandments, we do all the things that I talked about, but also let's love one another. Who are you having a hard time with in this room? What will it take for you to love that person? The answer is Jesus. And you know, I, I, you know I, don't, I don't really attend this church, but I know in any kind of organization like this, there are people who have issues with one another. Seek them out and love them the way Christ loved you. Be transparent with them. There are no secrets. Right? You give everything and there are no secrets. That's the secret to friendship. Right? This also applies to those who are married with your spouse. I know people who've been married for almost 20 years and they still don't know each other. They still have issues with one another. They're not friends. They coexist. God doesn't call us to coexist. God calls us to love him and to love one another. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Father, we thank you for your love for your people. We thank you for sending us your only son our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we thank you for giving up everything to be our friend. Thank you for reminding us that our friendship has nothing to do with what we've done. That you have done everything, Lord God. We thank you for that. And as your friend, Lord, Help us to live out our lives the way you've called us to. To love the Lord with all and with everything and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We confess that we can only do this through you, Jesus Christ. Come and empower your people, Holy Spirit, and transform us from the inside out. We worship you, Almighty God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.